saw the words that um, by reading, when you read out loud to yourself, ESL learners, when they read out loud to themselves, they will be able to learn the proper usage of the English language, learn how to use it properly. So that's why it's important for them to learn a word, not just the word, not just the meaning, the word forms, but also construct three sentences with it, okay? So I want you to think about a word. We're gonna do an exercise now. I'm gonna show you a picture. And that picture, I want you to look at something, okay? So when I talk, I want you to look, okay? I want you to look at three dots here. <coughs> Continue to stare at these three dots. And while I'm talking, you're still staring at the three dots here. And you can blink, it doesn't matter. You can blink and I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen next with this activity here. And as you look at it for about 20 seconds, I'm gonna change the screen and the screen is gonna turn white, blank. But I want you to continue to stare at a blank, white blank uh, board because something will appear in your mind's eye. I want you to notice what happened to it, okay? So I'm going to repeat the instructions again. I'm going to change the screen <coughs> into a white blank piece and you want to continue to stare at a white board because the picture will appear in your mind's eye. I want you to notice what happened to the picture. Who saw something? Raise your hands. You know, in a class, there will be always someone who cannot see it. It's fine. There's nothing wrong. <laughs> Let's try it again. One more time. This time around, I want you to notice. Stare it for 20 seconds. And I'm going to take the picture away. And then I want you to notice how long did that temporal picture stay in your mind's eye and for how many seconds, okay? Count how many seconds it stayed that way. And then see what happened to it. Five, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Who saw the picture? What happened? How long did it stay in your mind's eye? Six, six seconds. About two seconds and then it faded and then it came back. Yeah, and every time I blinked it would show up again. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I could still see the outline actually. Yeah, On the of it now? So, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> what do we see actually? What is that actually? You're seeing the negative image. Negative mm -hmm. image, right? Well, what we see is actually a theory of a memory that we talk about. What we, we talk about is what we call the short-term memory. Something came into your head, you saw it, and after that it has a trace decay. Oh, you forgot, you know, just like, okay, what's your name again? Oh, oh sorry, oh, what's the phone number again? I forgot, right? It's called a short-term memory. Huh? Why I'm talking about that is because of vocabulary. You're learning vocabulary, you want it to uh, stick in your head, right? So, how do you do with that? You rehearse it. Rehearse it many times and like until now, today, I've seen it so many times, that picture. Guess what? It's in my head. <laughs> I don't have to see it. I see it. So we call it permanent, right? Long-term memory, right? So what does it tell you about teaching the vocabulary? Eh? A lot of times you say, okay, you got to learn 20 words today, one time. And after that, what happens? You get it. Review, yeah, you forget. And then we talk about the storage time. It's a few seconds and they went away, right? And this one will stay weeks and days. So when you do a vocabulary, you want to be selective with the words that you choose. Those that are very frequently used, very practical. So that they will learn it. So I teach them at the end of this week, we have 20 words. You choose your own words. Don't come and impress me. It's for yourself to learn. Okay, you pick your own words from what you read or what you, you exposed to, whatever solicitation, no solicitation, they write it down or whatever. <clears throat> then they're going to review it. There's going to be a midterm oral exam. Sit down with me. I'm going to pick the words I like to get conscientious. They'll tell me the word forms or the synonyms and one sentence using it. Next. Okay, I go for that. 
Um, so they'll have collected maybe 40 words. I'm gonna I'm not gonna tell them how many words I'm gonna test now. I said 40 words and guess why? Why? Right? You want them to rehearse. Then at the end, the real time come at me. Alright, then 10 words only. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we talk about storage space. You do not chunk them so much that you go, what, 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 what number, what number? Uh, information overload, huh? Just like us, right? Finals around the corner, you <gasps> did not read it, cram it, cram it, cram it. No, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> so when you think about ESL learners, uh, vocabulary words, they learn, they're gonna cram it. Oh yeah, you explain to them. So for my class, I always show that picture and I tell them why. Why I want them to review often. Once a week, after that, after midterm oral exam, final exam, one more time. And after that, it's up to you. Three months later, just look through your flip chart again, your, your vocabulary card, and look through, okay? So, and... What does rehearsal look like in this context? In, in, in learning vocabulary, what is rehearsal? Do you have some recommendations for that? So... Or am I already going to get to that later, or...? No, no. I think... Did you mention, like, flip cards or Flip something? charts. Uh, I index cards. I have them right, and behind is the meaning. So, in the front, it's just the word. So they don't look at the meaning. Okay, behind is the uh, whatever we talk about, you know, the synonyms, word, uh, word forms, and, and, and whatever they want. Okay. So, uh, but rehearsal has a midterm oral and then final. So at least you go through twice with them. And, but then they would have learned it many times to prepare for the finals. Okay. Does that help? Thank you. Sorry. It's good. And and don't and think about chunking words together. You learn things by chunks, right? So that's why your number is 801-227-9997. So it's not so many words at one time. So you are chunking them. So I tell the people don't 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 crash, okay? Uh, with information overload. Just chunk a few at a time. Relate them together. Right? So we talk about vocabulary and how we can learn better the words. So these are just examples I have given, um, you know, mix and match uh, sentence and meaning for it. At the end, I, I create a story where they had to fill in the blanks. Oh, I love to create stories. And my kids will feel, wow, my teacher loves to write. You, know, you model that love for the English language, okay? And then we talk about writing. Writing is important. Uh, let me make sure I capture everything I want to talk about reading. Reading, there's another way to go into for intermediate students or beginning students. It's called a Randall's Cyber ESL. Okay, Randall. He's actually an LDS here uh, in the Valley. Randall, uh, I think Cyber ESL. He has a conversational English where you can hear, listen, and speak. At the end, there are five questions that students can fill out and know the answers immediately. You can even um, press a button and show the script. So it's like a reading assignment, not just listening, speaking. It's at a beginning, intermediate, academic, advanced level. So it's a host of uh, very fun topics that you can use, okay? Free of charge. And the other one is ESLgold.com. Uh, that one is pretty good too. Two good ones, resources you can use. All right, so reading, uh, to enhance reading, uh, and other resources include when you uh, have fun time, kids, um, like Disney movies are really great. Whenever you watch movies, I want you to put on the subtitles so the words come out so they can um, improve their reading speed. Okay, subtitles, very important, all right? So we have like the Disney Lion King is about 7,000 vocabulary words. That's awesome to learn English at the ground zero level. Next one, uh, we talk about listening, speaking. Oh, here, talk about writing first. Okay, let's talk about writing. Writing is interesting. Uh, I used to be so, I, I used to hate writing. Um, and I have to write six essays in three hours for a national exam. At the end, your hand shaking, you know, 30 minutes, one essay, and you study three years to take that literature exam. So it's terrible. And after my mission, I came back and uh, went to BYU Hawaii, where I met Brother Chan. Uh, I have to take an exam, a composition. I have to write a composition. I, was, I have not written anything for so long. And uh, very rusty. 
and they talk about your country. And so I wrote about country, Singapore, and then I erased it. And write again, I know I erased it and write again. And so after a while, I, I got a little hole on my paper. I remember it was so bad, my writing. I do not know how to write anymore. And but at the end, they, they tested me and said, wow, your English is really good. It's like, what, 96 out of 100 questions? And says, oh, okay, you might have a jet lag or something. So they let me go. <laughs> and, uh, but after a while, I realized uh, a way of writing that is very effective. A lot of us back home ESL learners, you're so careful with grammar that it inhibits your ability to create words. So I tell my kids, you have two sides of the brain, right? One is the creation side, one is the analytical side, right? So I want you, I want you to just write and don't worry about grammar, okay? First thing, just write out your ideas. Learn how to organize a skeleton, write out your scratch outline. After that, you're going to write and write and write. Don't care about grammar because you're going to do that later on. Just write, 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 write. Let the thoughts flow, right? The juices, right? Then after that, you say, okay, let you go back there and read, proofread. So for me, I want my ESL students to know and develop the habit of proofreading, which is very critical. Because for us, we have some parasites. Believe it or not, we do have parasites. And it's uh, grammatical parasites, we call it. Uh, a few things that is always we have to proofread. One is called singular plural. I have many books. <coughs> because when you're writing, you know, in the Chinese language, there's no S there. Book is book. You know, so you want to learn your singular plural, you watch your tenses. The next thing is your tenses. Because in many languages, there's no ED or whatever in there, you know, they just have to be consciously looking at the tenses. Past tense is all past tense. Watch out, watch out. Okay, so the second parasite. The third parasite is something, if it's Japanese, it will be the articles, the uh, off, <coughs> nothing, you know, it's not there, you know. Chinese is the same articles, uh, the uh, the uh, and and whatever they are more prone to, whatever. Right? So we talk about parasites, very important. Teacher modeling. Um, I believe in a very effective way of teaching ESL. I, I call it teacher modeling, the modeling mode, right? First thing is the teacher model the correct way of doing it. Then they have guided practice, okay? So what happens is, for example, we have the teacher, I would love to uh, tell them we're going to sit for a TOEFL exam. Some of the students will be doing that. And so they're going to be graded on the TOEFL 1 to 6, okay? 6 being the highest. And so we only have 5 minutes to write an introduction. How are we going to do it, you know? So I wrote down, okay, pick up 100 uh, TOEFL questions, one of them, choose. And the students choose one. Okay, I'm going to show you how I'm going to write my scratch outline. And after I'm going to write my introduction very fast. And then after that, they'll see, oh, my teacher made some mistakes too. Okay. Then after that, um, I will show them how I'm going to correct them. So for ESL learners, the most important is that they, they will make mistakes. Just let them create writing. But they need to know how to correct their mistakes while proofreading. That is the skill that you want to develop in them. That they can tear them apart and write it. And so, um, in the pen and practice. So, for example, this one here. Um, we'll talk about this measuring achievement, which is very important. Feedback is very important. What gets measured gets done. So you want to give a grade so they see where they're going, right? If you don't measure results, you cannot tell success from failure, meaning that um, if you don't tell them what's wrong with their writing, they do not know what they are. For example, in China, it's very fun that you have students who say, uh, usually, usually. It means usually. 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 It's very cute. <laughs> so you have to usually. Okay? Nobody tell you you cannot tell success from failure, right? Oh, I see. You cannot recognize failure. You cannot correct it, right? Nobody tell you it's usually. It's usually, usually. Okay? <laughs> you can't see success. You cannot learn from it, right? You have to model it so they can see it. You cannot see success. You cannot reward it. So, this is one example. Over here is the student. She has 17 errors. And what we do, we have a system, right? We have a system. Uh, 
word choice, subject verb agreement, <gasps> subject verb agreement, several reasons. You notice that? Uh, spelling mistakes, uh, count on count, determiner is missing, the articles right there. We have symbols that we use, right? I'm sure your class will have it. If not, you let me know. And then after that, her initial, this was the question asked. And her score was 3.5, which is the TOEFL score. One is zero, right? Zero means you don't say anything. Six is very high score for a TOEFL score. This is 3.5, means in the middle, smack, uh, low intermediate. So I usually give a feedback. I always tell some good things here. And then over there, I tell some things they need to improve. Uh, introduction, too clumsy. 3.5 when she came into my class, a score. And after that midterm, she got 4.5. I still continue to tell her what she's good at, what she needs to improve, and uh, some encouraging words, specific phrases, important. This is what happens at the end of the semester. Uh, she's able to capture it. So there are four errors only. Not too bad. And a final score 5.5. All right. So. That's, that's what happens. A skill is a skill. It can be learned. English is a skill, like swimming and biking. You tell your students, don't be afraid of English. Just say it, right? Just learn it. So writing, teacher modeling, guided practice, independent practice. Whenever you leave students out for homework, you will leave them out because they can do the homework successfully. Ah, that is very important. Uh, modeling, for example, you're teaching a grammar. Uh, he, she, it, um, is, okay? So you, you give them uh, some examples. He is a boy, she is, you know, going home or something, she is, something like that. Give examples. After that, guided practice means, okay, then you come out on the board, you give a few more examples with the blanks, and you ask who would like to try. They at home. They what? And you say they learn is and are, right? So those who are smart, they will say, I know the answer. They write it out. Okay, they will fill out the questions. The guided practice, meaning that once the teacher gives examples, like five, three examples of how the words is being used, then you write on the board with the blanks and those fast learners pick it up and they learn. And so what? The the slower learners will feel Oh, example, example. Oh, okay, I, I see enough examples. Okay, five to seven examples for guided practice. Enough that you think most of the students catch it. Okay, then you give them, leave them for independent practice so that they can practice with success because practice makes what? Permanent. 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 You practice wrongly, you learn wrongly, Cor incorrectly. Okay, practice makes permanent. Perfect practice makes perfect. Right? That's what we learn, right? Practice makes permanent. So for example, this is my, my model. Can you imagine? I dare to share my students my handwriting. I just go, I need five minutes, I need to write it out. I say, oh, done. Then I show them, okay, now I'm going back to uh, uh, revise. So I just cancel it out, you know, I, I show them how I do it. All right, and so they know, okay, that's how I'm supposed to write, okay. So teacher modeling is important. Sometimes for activities, writing activities, we talk it about a circle story, right? Home Alone. <laughs> a story where people go out and have an adventure, they return to home base, and they leave the home again, they go out in the world and have an adventure. It's a circle story, right? Some stories are like that. You can create a story chain. Everybody write a story. You create a character. Okay. Then after that, you create a situation, and they go for an adventure, and they push the paper. The paper gets to go around. Everybody creates something, and then it comes back the original one. She goes, "Oh, the story is not what I thought of, but it's pretty fun, right?" Or you can have one that problem-solving story, right? Think of an interesting character. Uh, then you create the problem. You create the solution, it doesn't work. Go for another solution, you create another solution. And they write another paragraph. So that is so fun. I always like that. So it's then at the end, a successful conclusion. Everybody now done with your piece of paper? 
Okay, let's go and make proofread, proofread. Proofread one person, change. Another person, five minute proofread, change. Five minute proofread. After that, go back to the original person, copy it down, 